When you're behind a computer screen late at night, no one knows who you are, where you are. I became part of this cyber community where people are exploring deviant thoughts and exploring their fetishes. I'm not the only one out there with these thoughts. They were accepted. The anonymity makes you try not to do the other person. Who could be the sicker one? Who could be the more depraved one? The baby was sleeping, the mom was sleeping. There was just nothing to do. And then you shut the computer off and that's it. I go back to being the regular me. But someone might say the anonymous nature could also bring out who you really are. In my worst nightmare, I could never guess that this would have happened. news, an almost unbelievable story. A New York City police officer has been arrested in a failed plot to kidnap dozens of women, cook them, and then eat them. Gilberto Valle has become known as the cannibal cop. The 28-year-old's wife uncovered the alleged plot. Charged in a conspiracy to commit kidnapping and allegedly used NYPD computers to get information on a list of victims. Defense lawyers did not deny his online activity, but called it a sexual fantasy that he would never act on. These are thoughts, very ugly thoughts, but we don't prosecute people for their thoughts. It comes down to this. Is this guy just fantasizing, or is there enough evidence to suggest he was really planning to do this? There's nothing we like better than, at least in fiction, a killer. You know, the worst, meanest, baddest, roughest, toughest serial killer in the world. Let's get inside their heart and mind and figure out exactly what they're about. And there are story archetypes that we all sort of adhere to. Gil, as the cannibal cop, was typed as well. Whether it was the monster of the week, or as this week's Hannibal Lecter, or as a master criminal, or as a vicious beast who needed to be controlled. Not only was this someone who seemed to have been planning to abduct and eat his wife and other women, but the idea of him wandering around with a badge was something so devious that it was unbelievable. But then when it actually made it to trial, there were two sides to this story. And when the defense stood up and said, this is a thought police case, and then suddenly it got even more theatrical and more interesting. It was the best that true crime has to offer because it was about a crazy side of human behavior that we don't get to see. And that's what was happening in real life here. Audience good? <clears throat> Excuse me, check one, check two. Check one, check two. Ready to go? Mm-hmm. There were a lot of myths about what was going on here. You get a picture painted in your head, you get a story, and you just start, once you have that initial concept, once that you have that preconceived notion, you start to seek out pieces of information that that go with that, that jive with it, and you disregard things that go against that. You know, I want everyone to have all the facts in front of them before they make up their minds for themselves. I grew up in Queens, New York. My parents separated at an early age. Mom was more soft love. You know, she was there for emotional support. 
dad would be the one to kick you in the butt. He was very, you know, strict, and we didn't want to disappoint my dad. Valle's arrest comes after the FBI obtained detailed accounts of the barbaric plans. The government says Valle made his sick plans in online chat rooms. His father in disbelief. Of course I'm shocked. Is it possible? I don't think so. As a parent now that all this has happened, a lot of different things come into the mind. Is he crazy? You know, all this stuff coming together. What is he? Is he crazy? How did you feel when you heard the first allegations about cannibalism and kidnapping? I couldn't believe it. I said, that's not my son. I'm like, there's got to be a mistake. That's not my son. You leave the mama kiss? The first time that I actually heard these internet chats, that's when I noticed, I'm like, okay, my son did have a problem. For the good boy that I know to be discussing women in such a way, it was just horrible. But if anything, he needed help. See a psychiatrist, see a therapist. I mean, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but, you know, some people choose to let out their frustrations by going to the gym, punching a punching bag. That might work for them. For some, it might be getting on a site like this and fantasizing, um, you know, thoughts of, Horrible thoughts like that. Well, he created a monster. He's a good writer. I mean, how can anybody believe that one person is going to kidnap a hundred women and cook and eat a hundred women? Which one was in the trunk of his car? Which one was in the spit over the fire? which one was in the oven. The fact that he's sitting there in his apartment while his wife and baby are asleep in the next room, and he's talking about, you know, slitting her throat, and the fact that he's going around in his police uniform all contribute to a sense of dread around it. But was he involved in the planning of a real crime? And at what point is it appropriate to step in? There was no real world attempt. But when they went through his computer, they found 24 sets of conversations. And 21 of them, people said, hey, is this for real? And Gil Valley said, no, this is a fantasy. No matter what I say, it's all make believe. But in three, he never said that. In fact, there were some moments in those chats where one of the participants would say, hey, are you for real? And Gil Valley would say, yes, he was. That could seem like evidence that this was a real conspiracy. We do not have thought crime in this country. Uh, we do not uh, prosecute people for what they think. It is permissible to have all of the thoughts from a criminal law enforcement point of view that Gilberto Valle had. What's impermissible is planning with another person to execute on those thoughts. Two charges had been brought against him. Conspiracy to kidnap, as well as an unauthorized use of a law enforcement database in order to gain some information about one of the victims. Conspiracy is the prosecutor's favorite instrument. In order to be convicted of an attempt, you have to not only intend to do it, but you have to go beyond preparation and cross a line that suggests that you're going to do it unless something stops you. Conspiracy allows you to move that line back. If two people just talk about doing something terrible and agree to do it and then take one overt act, they can be prosecuted and put in jail for the rest of their lives. 
The overt act doesn't have to be a crime itself. You know, it's not like you say, let's go rob a bank. And the overt act then is you steal a car to be the getaway car. It could be something that is entirely lawful. Otherwise, it just might have special meaning here. The defendant talked about disabling his victims using chloroform. He then searched how to make chloroform. The defendants talked about stalking their victims. And in fact, there was a search of a proprietary law enforcement only database as to where one of the victims lived. This is not a simple case of where you're going after somebody just who thought some evil thoughts. He took lots of steps in the direction of possibly doing terrible things. He traveled to Maryland to visit one of the alleged intended victims. This target of his supposed plot was his college friend. If you think this is a dangerous, dangerous man, then everything that he did in real life takes on this really ominous color to it. This trip to Maryland with his wife and baby could seem like a recon mission for a murderous kidnapping plot. If he, in fact, was planning to kill somebody specifically, then all of these would be overt acts within any meaning of the law. The question is, what was in his mind? And I'm not sure he knew. Opening statements today in the trial of the cannibal cop. In the words of both the prosecution and defense attorneys, this is going to be a bizarre trial. I don't get to draw nudes very often. I usually see people sitting in a chair, looking straight ahead at a judge. But I got to do people on spits, women being cooked and roasted, and visuals of dark fetish net. If you pull in, you could see little naked bodies. It's pretty amazing. I've never really seen anything like that in a trial. There were reporters there from all over the country. We'd heard a lot about this case, but now all of it was being laid out in front of us for the first time. There were three alleged co-conspirators, Michael Van Hise, somebody in Pakistan known as Ali Khan, and a man in England known as Moody Blues. He had these plans written out for how to kidnap women. He was planning on building a pulley apparatus in his basement to string women up and torture them and slow roast them. It says he had a giant oven that he planned on stuffing these women into. It all sounded crazy, but potentially true. We had a tome of the chats copied for us, and we were in the position to determine how much of it was real and how much of it was fantasy. I think we all agreed this man has a problem. This is sick. This is really quite sick. But we weren't there to convict on his sick mind. We were there to convict on a conspiracy to kidnap and kill and maim and rape. What made it very real was that he took pictures from real people in his life and shared them on these sites. And that, for me, takes it past fantasy. He had what was called a blueprint and had made a list of what he needed. He had the ability to retrieve all these materials that made it very real to us that any one of these women could have been a true victim of his. Alicia Friska early on became a major figure in the case. Investigators said Gil had been stalking her.
when Gil starts talking money with Michael Van Huys, that shift in tone is chilling. He's suddenly very, you know, grisly and mechanical and let's talk turkey. Here's how we're going to get it done. And that feels like things are starting to get more real. These fantasies were really, really scary. And the level of detail that Gill talked about and that other people talked about on the internet was also really, really scary. The reality, of course, coming back to reality, is that none of the things that they said ever came to pass. They often missed dates. They said, OK, I'll call you on Tuesday, and we'll do something then, and then nothing happens on Tuesday. Nothing happens for three Tuesdays. And then nothing ever happens at all. These are fantasies. There was no giant oven that could fit somebody inside of it. There was no pulley apparatus being set up in the basement. In fact, the basement was a laundry room for everyone in his Queen's apartment building to use and wouldn't be a very good torture chamber. Let's put it this way. If this was done on Craigslist, you would know you were being scammed. He didn't have any of the things you would need, according to his own blueprints and plans on how to do this. He made up false information that wouldn't be effective. You read about the case, you read about these chats, and you're horrified. You're turned off, you want to step away, and you're just like, this guy's a monster. Like, for, you know, whatever. Yeah, this is depraved language and unconventional thoughts, but there's no evidence. Shock in the courtroom, guilty of conspiracy to commit kidnapping, also guilty of wrongfully accessing a federal database. I almost froze in time, and all I kept hearing was guilty, guilty, guilty. For me to see him in shackles, it's heartbreaking. But you know, through all this, I haven't cried until now. And I feel like I want to scream. I never let it out. He's not a cannibal. He never ate anyone. Isn't that the true definition of a cannibal, is someone that eats human meat? How are you doing? I all due respect. How are you doing? Look at me. I'm strong. I went back to the prison, and that's when I broke down. I didn't want to do it in front of my family, but I broke down. I hear a couple of officers talking outside. One of them comes in and says, Valley got convicted. And another one says, get the fuck out. I, think I thought that guy was going home. Obviously, the case involved thoughts that were unusual and bizarre and, and frankly, very ugly. Um, and. I, I, we think that the jury just couldn't get past that. The conviction was devastating to everyone on the defense team. You're representing a human being um, whose liberty is on the line. And when you lose, you lost it for this human being. I just think the jury didn't want to have the what if moment. Sure, he didn't act in the real world. Sure, this was all in cyberspace, but what if? We were always worried that that thought would prevail over an objective, rational, non-emotional view of the evidence. People can be prosecuted for their thoughts and convicted, which is even sadder to think Thank about. from a At this point, I'm pretty depressed every day. Everyone thinks I'm facing sentencing. You know, technically I'm not yet. I'm still waiting to hear from the judge. They keep saying a couple weeks more. 
and it gets pushed back, and it gets pushed back again and again and again. Julia emailed me and she said she doesn't think it's going to be good. The cannibal cop case really raises the big question, what is the line between thought and action, right? Between fantasy and crime. And it's so gray. In a case where there's no victim, uh, there's no harm, was there enough evidence to show there had been an overact? The government was saying that all of his Google searches were overt acts in furtherance of a conspiracy. Gil, at some point, is thinking about eating people, and he starts typing, how do you abduct a girl? He starts doing research into chloroform and baking pans and knives for cutting people up. But the idea that a Google search would constitute an overt act, I think, is dangerous. That's where you get into thought crime. When we think about thought crime, you think about you know, George Orwell in 1984. You think about the thought police. You think about being put away simply because of something that's in your head. A thought crime in the modern age, in the post-George Orwell age, becomes more of a question of technology and its power to see what's on our minds much more often than it used to be able to. It's possible for the internet to know more about you than your best friend does, than your family members do, because what you type in the Google search box is often a very, very private thing, things you wouldn't even tell your friends and family. His wife is typing in things like, my husband doesn't love me. It's very sad to see, but I think it shows that Google searching is just an extension of the thoughts we have in our heads. Sometimes we're sitting at our computer alone and we just type them in. A lot of the searches that Gil was doing are as open to interpretation as those chats are. And one of the cases made by the defense was that this was storytelling, that the Dark Fetish Network was some sort of communitarian storytelling exercise. The same way that the prosecution is arguing that the chats are a window into Gil's thoughts, we can also look at literature as a window into the author's thoughts. Someone like Stephen King can write, you know, any number of disturbing things about human behavior, and nobody's putting him in jail. Why is it that we're fascinated by stories about violence? If you read, if you view movies. Our stories move us immediately into a safe space where we can imagine the worst thing possible, our darkest side. All these violent stories go back to what our most basic primal feelings are. We have propensity for violence. We have propensity for all sorts of horrible acts. But if you can act on those urges and stories, then you don't act on them in real life, in theory. The Cannibal Cup case worries me because we're entering a new era and it's almost uncharted territory. It's always been fairly easy for us to draw a line between fantasy and reality. I mean, they're the stories and images. And then there's what happens in real life. Well, we are in the postmodern era where these boundaries are becoming more and more difficult to draw. It's a daunting prospect to think that everything we do on the internet is in fact a window into our true authentic selves. It's more that the internet invites us to be both who we are and who we are not. The fear that a space for open trading of fantasy becomes instead a policed zone in which, you know, your thoughts may signal your future action is a real one. If we don't protect that space, I think we'll find ourselves in a much different society than the one that many of us thought we signed up for.
anybody should be allowed to write a dirty story on the internet or have a dirty fantasy, even if it's gruesome and tasteless and not some, something you would necessarily want to talk to your mum about over dinner. That's fine. It stops being fine when other real people are involved. that this guy used police databases to track down women, and he used his privileges as an officer of the law to do that. Oh, it just sends a shiver down my spine. I just can't, I just can't even. It's a extraordinary breach of trust between the police as an entity and the public at large. It wasn't just thought crime, it was real crime. The idea that everything that happens on the internet is fantasy and it's not really real is dangerous. It's just another way of not wanting to confront the fact that these evil thoughts and behaviours exist within human beings. It's not a product of technology or possession by the devil or any kind of outside force, it comes from us. The darkness comes from us. Look what I still have, his police uniform. I don't know why I kept it. Well, we're not gonna wear that, certainly not. This doesn't, I'm, do I have to iron now? Oh, God. I'm so nervous. <sighs> the judge is making a decision today. I called my family, I called my closest friends. I'm like, pray for me, pray for me. Because if there's gonna be bad news, I've been holding up all this time, Aaron. I've been holding up and I've been strong, but if I were to get bad news, I think that would be the end of me. I just want to give him a really big hug that nobody tells me, ma'am, ma'am, you got to leave. You know, I just want to hold on to him. I hope he doesn't have to spend one more night in that cell. Julia did say that, you know, if the news is bad, we still have other options. And what I said to her is like, well, in the meantime, my son is sitting in jail. Another year, another two years, how much longer? Oh, it's gonna be a media frenzy, but I'm not talking to anyone. Can you tell us what you know what's going to happen this morning? No. Well, just that, please. I want to see him not be a felon. I want to see him be acquitted. He didn't commit any crimes. I'd like to make a very, very brief statement. I want to take this opportunity to apologize to everyone who's been hurt, shocked, and offended by my infantile actions. I also want to thank my family from day one. Their support never wavered. I've needed that more than you, anyone will ever know during this impossible situation. Forgive me, I'm tired. I want to go home and spend some time with my family. Thank you very much. Alberto, 17 months in jail. Do you feel like justice has been done? Granting a judgment of acquittal on sufficiency of evidence grounds, which is what the judge granted, is very, very unusual. And it was front page news. And an acquittal means what? It means you're not guilty, OK? Doesn't mean that you're innocent. One could interpret at least some of the things Gil did as something that wasn't completely consistent with innocence. It could be considered an overt act when he went to the police database looking for targets. How are you going to feel if you let him off and he goes out and needs somebody? Those people have been there since 7 this morning.
Even though I'm acquitted, I'm in home confinement. You know, I haven't really gotten the cabin fever yet, but yeah, I mean, I'd, a day like today, I'd love to be outside, obviously. Last night, I'm home, and my son is here, and I thought I was dreaming. I couldn't believe it until this morning when he's like, Ma, I need underwear. Ma, I need this. Ma, I need that. I didn't know, I where, my I didn't know where anything was. was. I didn't know where anything was. My I, you know, boy is home. Oh, every, boy. Everything got packed up from my apartment. I wasn't there. He doesn't know where anything is. There we go. Nobody's alarmed that I have a fork in my hand with people around. Everyone's good? <laughs> All right. Be careful. You gotta, you gotta laugh about it. Of course. He's a danger to society. <laughs> the victims are in danger. The victims. I read the ruling late last night. I mean, the judge just slammed them. Somewhere in the page 80s, there's like five straight paragraphs where he ends all of them with, uh, this can only make sense as a fantasy role play. It means, like, it makes no sense whatsoever in a real conspiracy. He ends like five straight paragraphs like that. All right. Bye, Julia. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Does this come off, or we have to wait for the I don't government's know. appeal? No, but the, we have to wait for the appeal. Oh. That can be, a, that can be months. Mm-hmm. This is something that was private, anonymous. It was a, you know, a little bit of a skeleton in my closet. And now here, everything, this massive skeleton is out. It's the epitome of embarrassment to sit in that trial and have all these emails and chats read. I mean, it was like, hey, did I, how the hell did I, come up with something like that. It was, it was, it was bad. I really don't know how I came across it at first, but um, it was there, I tried it out. And people thought I was pretty good. People accepted it, you know? I mean, yeah, I had a stressful job, but uh, I don't know how much that played into all that. You know, I could have gone out and got drunk. I could have stayed up and watched TV. So I don't know if that had to do with a lot of it. Sexual fetishism is where our id comes out to play sexually. An item, a predicament, a mood triggers an arousal that is much greater than a simple bodily arousal. It's really difficult to understand why someone would be interested in something like that. A lot of people have asked the question, where does this come from? Because they think that something went wrong some abuse, some trauma, bad parenting. Many things have been blamed. Because we don't know clearly where things come from, there's a lot of room for interpretation and there's a lot of room for judgment and a lot of room for saying things like, they chose this. This is something that they could unchoose. But we don't choose what we're aroused by. We live in a very Victorian, puritanical culture when it comes to sexuality. The overt part of our culture sexually is very open. We exploit it, we talk about it, we model it, we advertise with it. It's in our music, it's in our art, it's in our television, it's in our movies. But covertly, I think people are pretty uncomfortable with their own sexuality. And when you juxtapose that schism between overt expression and covert inhibition, I think that's what creates sexual pathology and sexual problems and sexually compulsive behavior.
Did Gil ever ask you questions about sex growing up? Not really. When he went to, to college, I got a whole box of Trojans, you know, and he said, be careful, don't use them only once bottle or something like that. But then he just laughed and took them. It sounds to me like he was raised in an atmosphere where people didn't really talk about sex. And anything that fell outside of what was considered acceptable was horrifying, shameful, and something's wrong with me and I'm broken. I thought about what led him to get on these sites. And I wonder if it had anything to do with our divorce. Why did you guys decide to get divorced? I really don't want to get into that. I was very young, so I didn't really understand what was going on. My memories of them involve a lot of arguments, unfortunately. There weren't many happy times. His dad was very possessive, controlling, and verbally abusive. I didn't want my son to grow up thinking that that's how you treat a woman. I mean, is he going to talk about it? Is he going to admit that, yes, that's what made me do it? <laughs> or the devil made me do it? No, just kidding. People try to explain why this happened. I try and explain it, and it's tough sometimes. I guess the most important thing I got out of these chats, if there was anything I got out of it at all, was just acceptance. This is the first time I'm really opening up about all kinds of freaky stuff, you know, cannibalism and bondage. All these years, it's all bottled up, and here's when I have my chance to finally talk to somebody about it. It was such a relief to get it off my chest. When you're typing it, you don't really think about it. You're just sort of in the moment. But as soon as the computer went off, it's over. You know, I'm the person who I am. I'm incapable of any violence. I couldn't hurt a fly. Something that the defense really has to reckon with is even if he's innocent of planning a kidnapping, he's still admittedly very interested in kidnapping. He's on the record talking about it all the time. He can't get it out of his mind. How do you prove that he would never do this in the future? In the ramp up to the trial, they were concerned that this might break down into a he said, she said kind of case where the defense would say he's harmless and the prosecution would say, he's harmful. And what they really wanted was the voice of God to come down from on high and say, I've looked at the guy, and he's as nice as you and me. And that's what they got with Park Dietz. He is a titan in the field. He's interviewed John Hinckley Jr. He's interviewed Joel Rifkin. He's interviewed Andrea Yates. And almost without exception, he works for the prosecution. That he would draw the conclusion he drew, which is that this guy's as safe as you and me, that's a huge deal. But then, when the trial actually happened, they decided not to bring him on the stand. Were Dr. Dietz to have actually testified that deviant sexual fantasy doesn't relate at all to those who sadistically rape and who sadistically murder, he would have been slaughtered on cross-examination. Dr. Dietz himself has written about how people with sexually violent intentions, not just fantasies, but offenders to be, may seek out law enforcement positions because of their ability to more easily access prey. 
but the defense suggests that Officer Valley was indulging in these cannibalistic chats and websites because he was coping. So let me get this right. This kind of behavior is coping? You show me one sex offender treatment program that tells people, go on the internet and cope with your deviant sexual arousal by just engaging with chats about cannibalism people. I've just, boy, what, what a therapeutic remedy. A psychiatrist that was retained by the defense said that looking at these websites was a way to cope with those urges. In your experience, have you, have you heard of anything like this? Um, no. I, I, I have not heard of anything like that. I don't know that I would say that looking at those websites is a way to cope with or manage those urges. I would personally not prescribe that to a patient and say, well, if you're having these violent uh, fantasies, just look at websites online and that'll help quell those, those thoughts and urges. In fact, I would wonder whether it would excite those urges if you exercise certain neural pathways, what happens is there's a certain reward circuitry that gets activated in the brain, and when you reach a certain threshold, it becomes a habitual or compulsive pattern. And the pathways to the prefrontal cortex that are responsible for judgment and reasoning and making good decisions shut down simultaneously. So you have a combination of elevated, pleasurable stimuli in the brain with poor judgment. And that's kind of a perfect storm for problems. What is the capacity of people who are otherwise strangers, just connected by chat room or internet connection, to influence someone into crime from fantasy? Some fantasies remain fantasies. Some fantasies graduate. The website or the chat or the activity is no longer interesting to them in the same way. But acting on it would be. The connection between fantasy online and subsequent acting out is impossible to predict. You can't just assume that fantasy means that they will enact a behavior, but you can't also assume that they will not. And I will be the first to tell you, in psychology and psychiatry, we are not good at predicting violent behavior. The highly unusual facts of this case reflect the internet age in which we live. Valley had discussed kidnapping, torturing, raping, murdering, cannibalizing women with 24 individuals. At trial, the government conceded that 21 of these communications are nothing more than fantasy roleplay. The government nonetheless contends that Valley's communications with Van Heys, Ali Khan, and Moody Blues reflect a real kidnapping conspiracy. Because the government did not offer sufficient evidence to permit a reasonable juror to distinguish between the Valley's alleged real chats and his conceded fantasy chats, the jury's verdict on count one cannot stand. I like when he says, when he ends with that, the jury's verdict cannot stand, must not stand. I just hope, you know, the government doesn't appeal this and this is officially over. You know, right now we have that looming over our heads. Until this thing comes off, it's not over, you know? 
go to the beach. All right. Make my make my cross country trip. Yeah, those those would be good times when it when it happens. Kill, kill. Oh no. Perhaps the most significant aspect of this story is that valet sexuality was hidden. If one has to wall off an entire aspect of what turns them on, then one has a fundamentally dishonest relationship with their partner. And when you have a dishonest relationship with your partner, you may be able to maintain appearances, but the story is never going to end well. He always said that because he got home late, he couldn't go right to sleep, so he would play video games, watch TV, go on the internet for a couple of hours. Then after I got pregnant, it kept getting worse. He would stay up until three, four, five in the morning or just not come to sleep in our bed. And then all this really weird stuff started happening. She had a... Uh installed spyware on the computer and you know she found the chats everything that this case is about she found it all it logged every keystroke that is made on the computer and every website that is visited and takes pictures every five minutes or so of whatever is happening on the computer screen there were all of these websites that i'd never seen dark fetish net sexy amazons dark fet motherless fet life I mean, I know S&M is kind of popular, like Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, but this seemed different. The girl on the front page was dead. I noticed on one of the screen pictures that was taken an email address that I didn't know about. So I went to Yahoo Mail and entered the password that Gil had told me to use for everything. All of a sudden, I was staring at pictures of my friends, pictures of people we knew. There were thousands. She confronted me that morning and left with the baby. I didn't really know what she was planning on doing or how long she was planning on staying. We did stay in touch throughout. Partners may question themselves and say, well, why didn't I see this before? But we've had an unexpected proximity to a side that he doesn't show to others, wouldn't even show to his wife. I was going to be tied up by my feet and my throat slit. They would have fun watching the blood gush out of me over and over again, just kept saying that the suffering was for his enjoyment, that he wanted to make it last as long as possible, that he had no remorse. It was tough to listen to her, you know, talk about our relationship. We were together for three years. I thought they were three wonderful years. Yeah, I, I would do this at night, but it didn't affect my personal life at all. It didn't affect my job. It didn't affect my family. Um, I was still the good husband. I was still the good father. I was still doing great at work. It's hard to say what to do with the input of a law enforcement officer who's an accused sex offender. Every person charged with a crime will deny, rationalize, and distort 
facts and details in order to make his behavior acceptable. I'm doing this on the internet, but you know, I'm doing it because my wife is sleeping with our newborn. Oh, I get it. He gets it. As far as sleeping, I started talking to this guy from England. So that, that was, it was just, just as simple and banal as that, the time difference. So I would start chatting with him over there. It's 8 in the morning. It, over here, it's 2 o'clock. And normally, I'd be done by then. But yeah, now, now I'm playing a game with this guy. And you know, so I'd stay up a little later. And that's all it was. Isn't that amazing? And it's the truth. The day she puts a spyware on is the day I, I'm like, I'm moving on from this. Because like I said before, um, it was starting to affect my family life and that I was staying up later and I didn't want, you know. I always said once it starts, so if it ever affects my family, it's got to go. So it had to go. And that day, if I'd done it a day sooner, none of this would have happened. Isn't that incredible? I told that to, you know, my lawyers and Deets that, you know, I'm not making that up. That's a, that's a God honest truth in my daughter's life. I went on that day to delete everything. It's almost like there's a higher power who said that this had to happen, and maybe one day we'll know why. You know, I, I honestly don't know about this guy. This guy, I mean, this guy, I, I mean, I, 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 I think the, the fact that they got him off on that uh, defense is pretty lucky for him. It's pretty unusual to have that kind of level of violent thought and fantasy and to get off on the defense. I would not be shocked if he ends up back in jail. It disturbs me that Mr. Valley is out you know, do I worry for harm? Not really, um, but, you know, he's a disturbed man. We, as the jury, were confident that from what we had, what we were given, we made the best decision we could. And when it was overturned by the judge, I, I, I felt betrayed. It was a very difficult decision. We were not in agreement from the very beginning. Some felt more strongly that he was guilty. Others needed much more proof. Ultimately, the weight of it was that this decision was going to ruin this man's life. When the trial ended and the judge read the charges, before we even talked about anything, we wanted everyone to understand what the charges were and what needed to be satisfied in order to convict. Illegal use of his police database, the entire jury agreed that he was guilty immediately. And it was just the conspiracy charge that we really needed to take our time with. We dissected the chats that he had with various people and this particular line of chats with Moody Blues was very different from the others. We collectively as a jury felt the tone had changed. We read them over and over and over again and even the people reading them had to stop at some point because it, we just couldn't take it. It was very, very hard. He was taking the steps to take it to that next level, to 
make his fantasy become real. How long does one wait till one goes through with it? The trip to Maryland was planned to meet this college friend and he was bringing his wife and his daughter along on this trip. The defense maintained that this was just a trip to visit a friend. But his chats with Moody Blues indicated that he couldn't wait to go see her, that he couldn't wait to think about what he was going to do to her, and also find out where she worked and get some more background information. It was proven that he did drive by her office because he had texted to her about, was that your building? Apparently, the building has some significance on this road. He did meet her for brunch with his wife and his daughter, and all seemed normal just friends getting together and talking, and her meeting his wife and his daughter. A normal person in real life comes back from a road trip. They've been driving. They've been with their family and their baby. And they come home, and they unpack, and they relax, and they figure out what they're going to do for dinner. Based on the timeline, this man went straight to his computer and straight to his friend to chat, almost like he was reporting in. And you could tell he was excited about it. The fact that he came back from this trip and one of the first things he did was write to Moody Blues was enough to say that he had made this trip, he had a purpose for this trip, he satisfied that purpose, and he shared it with his conspirator. And that, I think, ultimately led to his downfall. You know, we sort of expected this. I mean, we felt good, maybe they wouldn't, but this just buys them more time. I look delish. You know, I gave myself a couple hours just to be down, but, you know, if I'm down, they win. So I don't want to let them win any, you know, I don't want to let them win anything, you know? Even in jail, I said that all the time. Like, if I'm down, the government's winning. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> okay. I, I always overdo things. I guess mom can get used to having me at home. I can get used to this real quick. <laughs> I'm going to be stuck in here for how many more months? You know, I was looking at possibly going out this weekend. Uh, I mean, I thought it was over, and it's not over. It doesn't mean they're going to go through with it. Don't forget. They're smart people. They have to know I'm innocent. They have to know there's no evidence. They have to know they screwed up. Maybe they're thinking, how would it look if we just dropped it? In a sense, they had to go through with this just to save face. You know, what are they going to do, BS the Court of Appeals now in paperwork? They can BS a jury, they can't BS judges. My father always taught me to defend the underdog. And the underdog is always the person who is on trial with all the resources of the state, the police, the prosecution, being used against that person. 
I think juries have often been unwilling to apply the presumption of innocence. When I have a jury, the first question I ask is, if the evidence shows that the defendant probably did it, will you convict? And many of the jurors say, of course we will. I say, strike that juror. Probably isn't enough. You have to be willing to free somebody who will probably do something bad and who has probably done something bad. Probably just isn't enough. Better 10 guilty go free than one innocent be wrongly confined. We just can't allow our system to begin to err on the side of putting people in jail if they may not commit crimes. They said that the line between fantasy and reality crossed when he had lunch with the girl in Maryland. So that makes it seem like shit, like when Gil had the lunch with this girl, you know, maybe he was thinking about something. As far as coinciding with the chat, I knew, like, yeah, I had the chat, but, you know, I was with my wife and daughter. Nothing ever happened at the brunch. They made the whole weekend out to be a surveillance episode. I went down Friday night. I'd seen, I, I saw five people that weekend. We did things Catholic as a family down in Maryland. And the whole weekend was about surveillance. I mean, it's just... And this is the database. Right. When the prosecution makes a big deal of him using this computer to look up information about these women, yes, it's a violation and yes, it's a crime. But looking at the timeline uh, between when he actually did those searches and when he was having chats about those women with other people on the Dark Fetish Network, it's not exactly clear that he's planning anything. have had more of a case if he looked up that information and then five minutes later there's a record of him emailing somebody from the dark fetish network saying here's the address but he didn't even give anybody on the dark fetish network their addresses he didn't even give them their last names there's one potentially very telling moment in the chats where moody blue says what's her address and gill says i can't do that i can't give you that and suddenly the, the the bubble bursts This is Gil Googling someone he has the hots for. Only instead of Google, he's using the police computer because he's at work and bored and says, oh, I have the hots for Kimberly. I'm going to check out the information in the police database for her. And so he does. And that's sick and creepy and weird. But is this the action of a guy who's planning and conspiring a kidnapping? The prosecution had to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt the highest standard in the law he actually was agreeing to commit the crime of kidnapping women. And here, in this case, I don't think they did. There might be a tendency to want to punish people for who we think they are, as opposed to what they've actually done. And so this could be a case where the jury heard the evidence and thought, I don't maybe think he was going to do it this time, but I'm worried he might do it in the future. I'm worried about what kind of person he is. I don't like this guy. I think he's creepy. And so the you know way they resolve that tension is to convict. Well, we were convicting someone on what he wanted to do, not what he did. So we had to believe that he was going in that direction to, to actually commit a crime. It's easier to make a decision when you have fact with beyond a shadow of a doubt, reasonable doubt. And, and there was not anything that was fully and completely compelling. We had to understand this man through these chats. When the police got this information, absolutely they were right to act on it. No one in their right mind, I think, would suggest when the, uh, his wife came and said, look what I have, these disturbing chats, and my husband, by the way, is a police officer with some power, that they should have said, you know, go home, ma'am, no big deal, right? What should they have done? They should have initiated an investigation. 
It could have been as simple as an undercover agent signing up for an account on darkfetishnet.com and trying to engage him and make real plans. Since Steele's conviction and since it's been tossed out, there's been movement on other cases related to the Dark Fetish Network, where the feds took the extra step of creating a sting operation. And there have been people who've been convicted after they met with agents to plan the kidnapping. One of them, Ash, actually went so far as to create a kit. He, he started collecting items that one might use in a real abduction and torture scenario. He had needles and handcuffs and speculums. He even went and he bought a stun gun. You can see that they took this so much farther than, than Gil did. It makes you realize that there is this whole, um, so many steps before you get to actually lunging out of a car at someone and trying to hurt them. Some very reasonable people could come to the conclusion that unless and until he's in a car with the rope and the chloroform headed to wherever victim three lives, it's not enough. Some reasonable people could also say even that's not enough. It's not enough until he gets to the doorstep and actually starts walking up the steps and is about to hit the doorbell and say, hi, it's Gilberto, can I come up? And some people would probably even quite reasonably conclude that we really don't know what he's going to do in that apartment. There is always reasonable doubt about whether or not someone is going to take a particular action. We don't know, right? And police officers don't have some magical psychic wand that allows them to know either. We don't want to give the government the ability to decide what fantasies meet the thought police's bar for acceptability. That bar is rightly high. Look, if the First Amendment protects someone fantasizing about violently raping and killing and eating a woman, it's going to protect pretty much anything you're thinking about. And that's what principles mean. They make us uncomfortable, and we apply them regardless. We're going down to court for my sentencing for the misdemeanor. The big news out of today will be whether or not this house arrest is over. Number two, is the government going to go through with their appeal? The interesting thing about what's happening with Gil now is that he no longer is just the cannibal cop. He's patient zero in the thought police epidemic that might sweep the nation. We're all determined to try and stop horrible tragedies before they actually happen. And we feel like we can do it. That all we have to do in the future is monitor the right things and set up enough cameras and do enough computer surveillance. But to me, that is an extraordinary assumption to be making. Good morning. If we had an MRI that could read your mind, would we want to comb through society and find the true deviants among us who think these deviant thoughts and really mean to execute them or would execute them in a perfect environment? Certainly in science fiction, like Minority Report, where they talk about pre-crime, that's a dystopic vision. And I think that's because when you think about it, it's often hard for any individual person to even know themselves the line between what they're imagining and what's real. It's part of the mystery of humanity. You know, there's been a lot said about me when these allegations came out. And, you know, that's not who I really am. That's never, people who know me the best 
know that and I'm ready to show people who I really am. That's it. Can you give us some idea what got you involved in these a, issues in the first place? No. I'm not gonna comment on that right now. One of the most troubling gray areas of this case is that most of us don't understand why someone would act on an impulse like this. I don't think the jurors, I don't think the media, I don't think many people at all could really look into his heart and really understand Gil as a person. Is he a harmless teddy bear of a guy or is he a nefarious master criminal? I really don't know. Look at this beautiful thing right here, bare skin. I think part of you wants me back, but the other part of you wants to kill me. I don't know which Gil is real. I'm afraid I don't know you at all. What makes somebody an ethical human being isn't what they think, but what they choose to do with the thoughts. Somebody can be having the most dark, depraved thoughts, but if they don't do anything about them or find an outlet that is entirely harmless, then that doesn't stop them being a decent human being. And in the gap between thought and action, that's where people actually discover what kind of human being they are. And I think people have to be allowed to make that discovery and then live with the consequences. There's no news yet with the appeal. They haven't submitted anything yet. Today's the deadline. So I guess they have until 11.59. And they'll probably wait till 11.50. But... They're gonna appeal, I mean... I don't want to get my hopes up, but you didn't mention it in court. I don't know. They haven't filed it yet. But I don't want to get my hopes up. It's already been such a good day. You know, this really could be over tonight. Completely. They have until midnight, so we're waiting until midnight. Then that's it. They never asked for more time. And that, you know, the thing better be dismissed. Nothing we see yet. Tick tock, tick tock. Let's go, midnight. <laughs> go on. What an ending it would be, you know? Like today, it would all end. I'm, you know, the supervision, I'm not worried about. It's not like I'm gonna go out and commit a crime or anything like that. I have no desire, not the slightest inkling to get back on any fetish website. Those days are gone. And uh, nothing will be hanging over my head anymore. I fell asleep and I woke up, it's after 12, I'm like, it's quiet down there. My heart starts racing. That's concerning, this is concerning me though, I don't know what this is. I'm on something called Cases Selection Table and we're on the second circuit for sure. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. All right, fine. They file it around 7.30. Really? Yeah. We were looking at the wrong thing. I was expecting it. This is 
same arguments, you know, that I conducted surveillance. Oh, dear God. Yeah. So they really I, want to make it. I, 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 I attempted to establish trust. It's laughable. I'm not worried. Don't you know? Don't worry about it. Today was, you know, enough of a good day. I'm not worried at all. All right. I'll stop. I'll stop by tomorrow. All right. All right. All right. See. You. All right. Hope my cell phone is not 700 yards from somebody I knew in high school. Everything sort of overwhelms me sometimes with the appeal coming and the notoriety that's now surrounding my life. Well, sometimes I feel like someone's watching me. But the first couple weeks I was out, I realized that no one was really recognizing me. So I started getting more and more comfortable going out. And I thought the next step was to get to dating again. It's been a long time, you know. I think sometimes I'm craving a little, you know, I'm craving some companionship. There's nothing wrong with that. If I do go, you know, out with a girl, at what point in the dating process do I bring this whole thing up? She'd either be, you know, run for the hills or she'd be somewhat curious, interested. I don't know, there have to be people out there who are interested. But some people are gonna think I should be locked up for the rest of my life. There's no getting around that. I made a bad mistake, a really bad mistake. But. You know, it's not going to cost me the rest of my life.